Thank you for inviting me to talk today, and I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person. So thinking about cardiac disease and uh, lessons from high income countries, I thought it'd be useful to think about what it is we really need to know to uh, address this issue going forward. Firstly, we need to know how big the problem is. Uh, we need to know which women are dying and what they're dying from. And most importantly, we need to think about what actions are needed to prevent women from dying in the future. So when thinking about this from an Italian context, uh, maybe you can hold those questions at the forefront of your mind. So moving then to uh, look at uh, the UK data, um, you can see the second uh, bar along here uh, is, is cardiac disease, which shows that thinking about as a, as a single cause, uh, cardiac disease remains uh, the leading cause of maternal mortality in the UK. And these are data from 2018 to 2020, which were published in our maternal mortality report last year. Um, that rate has not decreased statistically significantly since we began our enhanced case identification, which was introduced in, in 2000 to 2002. And here are those data presented graphically. And you can see that that really is a, a flat line uh, with a possible hint um, of a decrease towards the end. But thinking uh, about the women who are dying, it's important to think about their characteristics. And I've just highlighted three things here amongst the, the characteristics of, of all women who died from direct or indirect causes in the UK in 2018 to 2020. Um, and that's emphasizing obesity. So uh, between a quarter and a third of women who died had a, a, a BMI of 30 or greater. Um, uh, between uh, a quarter and a third also smoked during pregnancy. And that compares with a with a population rate of around 14 uh, percent. But notably, if you look at the proportion of women with pre-existing cardiac problems, very small proportion of women actually had known cardiac disease. Um, when we look at uh, disparities or uh, inequalities in outcomes from women from different population groups. We can see that women who live in the, the poorest 20% of areas in the UK have very much the highest uh, maternal mortality rate. So looking overall at maternal deaths in the UK, uh, women who live in those areas are about two and a half times more likely to die uh, during or up to six weeks after pregnancy compared with women who live in the 80% um, most uh, affluent or richest areas. It's important that we recognize that uh, particularly with cardiac disease, the, the impact of pregnancy is not all realized within that period of uh, uh, during pregnancy or up to six weeks and uh, a substantial proportion of women who die in the late perinatal period also die from cardiac disease. So around one in 10 of the women who die uh, during that uh, six weeks to one year period uh, also die from cardiac disease. And when we look at the characteristics specifically of women who die from cardiovascular disease, many of those themes are echoed uh, and even stronger uh, amongst the characteristics of women. So you can, uh, uh, amongst those women who died, uh, almost half live in the most deprived 20% of areas. 
Around four in 10 uh, were over 35. Uh, just over a third were obese. Uh, just under a third belonged to minority ethnic groups. Um, and that theme again, only 10% of women who died from cardiac disease were known to have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So you can see that these patterns very much echo the uh, risk factors that you see uh, outside of pregnancy, which is why we've emphasized in our recurring messages, and you'll see it here on the right of this graphic, uh, that women who are older, obese, smoke or have diabetes or a family history may be at greater risk of heart disease but we still see that their risk is under-recognized because they are pregnant women. Also important to emphasize that heart disease can occur in pregnancy for the first time. And we've had to emphasize that chest pain is a, a red flag, as is breathlessness when resting and especially when lying flat because there is a tendency to dismiss these symptoms as uh, relating to pregnancy rather than uh, the concerning symptoms that they are. I just want to emphasize a little bit more uh, wider thinking when we're thinking about uh, cardiovascular disease in women uh, across the life course. And it's just worth emphasizing, and it's this box in the middle here, that actually uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes can be a marker of risk for cardiovascular disease as well. So thinking particularly about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, but also gestational diabetes uh, and, and placental disorders such as, uh, as growth restriction, as well as preterm delivery. Um, that is important. Uh, because um, it's, it's important to recognize the, the potential additive risk. So the conventional risk factors for cardiac disease are more likely to be under, undiagnosed or unrecognized in women and particularly in pregnant women. But also we need to think about the, the window of opportunity we have by recognizing the key aspects of a woman's reproductive history, which may influence or reveal uh, her short-term and long-term cardiometabolic and cardiovascular risk. So thinking then uh, about the different causes of uh, maternal cardiac death, it, it won't surprise you um, uh, having uh, been through that discussion of risk factors, that about one in five of the women who die, uh, die from an ischemic cause. Uh, around a quarter have other myocardial disease, which is also linked to some of those common risk factors. Uh, just over one in 10 have valvular heart disease or aortic dissection. Uh, and around uh, a, a fifth have a, a sudden arrhythmic cardiac, cardiac death uh, with a morphologically normal heart. And just to emphasize the, the risks of cardiac disease uh, mirror the increased risks we see in, in uh, deaths overall. So uh, the, the risk of a, a maternal death due to cardiac disease is about uh, six times higher amongst women who are over 40 compared with those who are in their early 20s. Um, and similarly, the, a very similarly increased risk amongst women who are living in those deprived areas. Um, and this is just a, a vignette, uh, the, the um, uh, story of an older white British woman who was experiencing cough and wheeze during the week after she gave birth. Um, her midwife attributed this to the uh, inhalational analgesia she'd used during labor. Um, so you see this tendency to uh, dismiss symptoms. 
The following week, she presented to hospital with increasing symptoms and at which point her severe cardiomyopathy was diagnosed and she was admitted. Sadly, she deteriorated very rapidly um, and her care was not escalated and she died a few days later. She was failed in life, uh, failed in death as well as life in that no post-mortem uh, examination was undertaken. So her final cardiac diagnosis was not clear. And this is particularly important because no cardiac genetic tests were undertaken. So we have no idea of the significance of this woman's early death for her family. Um, and uh, this woman's care emphasized to, to us the importance of being aware that wheeze can be due to pulmonary edema um, and the recommendation that wheeze, which does not respond to standard asthma management, uh, should be considered a red flag symptom. Um, and this goes along with uh, red flags that we've previously identified and which are um, covered in the Royal College of Physicians Acute Care Toolkit around managing acute medical problems in pregnancy, emphasizing uh, breathlessness red flags, including sudden onset breathlessness, uh, orthopnea or breathlessness when lying flat, breathlessness with chest pain or fainting, uh, respiratory rate of over 20 breaths per minute, um, an oxygen saturation of less than uh, 94%, and a breathlessness with tachycardia. And similarly, uh, chest pain red flags, pain that requires opioid analgesia, pain radiating to the arm, shoulder, back or jaw, sudden onset associated with uh, hemoptysis, breathlessness, fainting, and um, abnormal observations. Two uh, extremely obese women who had uh, significant bleeding should have received postnatal thromboprophylaxis according to Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists guidelines, but their risk was not properly assessed and they did not get the uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis that they should have been prescribed. Um, those women uh, both collapsed and died from coronary thrombosis a few days after discharge from hospital. And the point here is that it's important to recognize that risk factors for blood clots are overlapping with risk factors for uh, cardiac disease. And both of these women had clear risk factors for both. Um, and the clear message here is that we need to think uh, beyond uh, venous thromboembolism alone when we're thinking about those risk factors, or we may miss making a, a cardiac diagnosis. So being aware of those common risk factors and providing advice to women about the symptoms and signs of heart disease, as well as those of venous thromboembolism, is really important. So thinking about the, the risk factors in common, age, obesity, smoking and family history and symptoms and signs in common, shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, hemoptysis, tachycardia, tachypnea and, and low oxygen saturations. I have emphasized that most women who died during or after pregnancy were not known to have pre-existing cardiac disease. But it is important that we do recognize that some women uh, will become pregnant who do have known cardiac disease. Um, and this is one such woman. She had a complex medical and mental health history, including known cardiac disease. And she presented with an unplanned pregnancy. There was no documentation of either pre-pregnancy or contraception counseling following her cardiac diagnosis. And it's really important to re-emphasize the importance of both pre-pregnancy counseling and contraceptive advice. And this should be everybody's responsibility. She was short of breath uh, throughout most of the, the pregnancy. So one of those, those red flags 
Um, her cardiac failure was identified in her third trimester. Um, she was then uh, transferred to the regional specialist centre where she received a good multidisciplinary team involvement. Um, uh, sadly, unfortunately, she uh, did deteriorate and died a few weeks postpartum. But I think it's important emphasizing here uh, the need for that uh, specialist medical care. Um, and what we have recently uh, introduced in the UK are what we call maternal medicine networks, which means that there are experts in pregnancy medicine available for uh, to provide opinions, but also to uh, as um, a central specialist centre which women can be uh, referred to. Um, and I guess this is something to think about how you might be considering organising uh, care for such women uh, in Italy or as the very least uh, knowing as a as a midwife as a doctor caring for pregnant women who's uh, who you would be seeking advice from if you had a woman uh, who you were concerned about cardiac disease um being aware of how to conduct contact that regional maternal medicine lead um, is an important message in the UK and similarly knowing how to seek that urgent multidisciplinary senior review for women you are caring for in Italy is, is an important message. That multidisciplinary team is a really uh, useful forum for discussing complex women uh, with multiple, multiple morbidities um, and can help improve coordination of care as well as support for, for all um, acute care providers. Here's another example of a woman who developed significant breathlessness in her third trimester. She was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. She was immediately transferred to a tertiary center where there were experts in the management of, of, uh, of the condition. She was, uh, she went, underwent extensive investigation as well as multidisciplinary discussion. She had an elective uh, cesarean section planned and she was actually admitted to the intensive care unit preoperatively to optimize her care. Uh, she then had her cesarean section, which was uh, uneventful until shortly after she gave birth, uh, when sadly she collapsed and was unable to be resuscitated. But the important message here is that thinking about that uh, pre-planning, um, that antenatal multidisciplinary team planning, and uh, specifically thinking about involvement of the critical care team, uh, for women such as this with serious morbidity who are anticipated to require that admission to intensive care after giving birth. Uh, it's important to recognise that uh, in addition to the expertise you um, uh, can get from the maternal medical team, uh, intensive care unit clinicians can play a vital role and expertise in care planning particularly with women who uh, are the most severely unwell, because these decisions are often complex and nuanced. Just um, one uh, further message thinking about women who have had uh, valve replacements, and just to reiterate the very high risk nature of uh, giving birth with a metallic uh, valve replacement. So this woman uh, was known to have a metallic mitral valve and she had uh, was on uh, warfarin anticoagulation. Uh, she had a confirmed pregnancy at six weeks and at that stage was unsure whether she should continue the, whether she should continue the pregnancy and was considering termination of pregnancy. The warfarin was changed to, to tinzaparin, low molecular weight heparin. 
Um, and uh, although she was discussing uh, termination of pregnancy before that could be uh, carried out, she had a thromboembolic stroke. Uh, thrombosis, thrombus was identified on the mitral valve. And this was after she had been switched from warfarin to low molecular weight heparin. Uh, and sadly, she uh, uh, lost the pregnancy, deteriorated and died a few months later. So uh, a few relevant um, recommendations uh, in, in, in this instance, uh, again, emphasizing the importance of, of contraception or pre-pregnancy planning, neither of which there was any evidence uh, that this woman had received. In, in this uh, situation, we know that no anticoagulation regime is ideal. Uh, the management uh, requires a careful balance of maternal and fetal risks. Uh, and whatever the choice, the importance is that the, that the dose of anticoagulation is therapeutic. Um, and it's really important to recognize that if women are not planning to continue their pregnancy, warfarin is actually the safest anticoagulant to consider. Um, and there women may be more safely managed without transition to, to low molecular weight heparin. So um, I think it's important with, with confidential inquiries to, to recognize the uh, substantial success of um, uh, the um, uh, confidential inquiries in preventing deaths from specific disorders. And here you can see in the UK how uh, successful we've been in preventing deaths from, from preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. But I just wanted to, to get you to think back to those wider risk factors when we're talking about cardiovascular disease. And actually uh, the risk associated with uh, hypertensive disorders and specifically with uh, blood pressure control postnatally. So this is some, some work in progress from uh, one of my visiting postdoctoral researchers showing um, the difference in uh, cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events amongst women who have had preeclampsia or other hypertensive disorders whose blood pressure is controlled uh, at six weeks postpartum, and that's the graph on the left, and whose blood pressure is controlled at six months postpartum. And you can see uh, that in, in both groups, there's a substantial difference between women whose blood pressure has been controlled and those whose blood pressure is not controlled. Um, and this uh, uh, obviously is evidence of a, a potential window of opportunity to think about women's long-term cardiovascular health. Um, this is an example of a very small pilot trial, which actually suggested that uh, blood pressure self-management in the immediate postpartum period led to a sustained uh, reduction in, in blood pressure three or four years later. So uh, emphasizing the potential for benefit. So um, just to summarize, I think uh, confidential inquiries into maternal deaths have been hugely successful at decreasing women's deaths from protein from pregnancy related conditions during pregnancy and immediately postpartum. But we've got no evidence of an impact on maternal cardiovascular disease or particularly on women's deaths uh, long after pregnancy. So thinking about that window of opportunity that those additional risk markers. Cardiovascular disease uh, remains the global leading cause of women's death. And with the obstetric transition, I think it will increasingly being the lead, be the leading cause of maternal death, as it clearly is in many high income countries. Uh, and we've got to recognize uh, the uh, importance of, of recognition of risk factors, symptoms and signs during and after pregnancy as being essential to prevent future deaths. Thank you very much.